But we read again in chapter 18 of Luke's Gospel, And he, Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in the city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not bear me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? And so as we continue to look at this prayer through the persistent widow, we talked weeks ago that the widow that Jesus used, and you know, Jesus has a sense of humor because he uses this widow for a reason. He uses her, as we said about three weeks ago, because widows were looked at as the least of the least in the society during Jesus' day. And so what we learn from that is that no matter how you feel about yourself, even if you think you're the least of, the, of all seven billion people on the face of the earth, you can be heard by, by God. So we continue to look at this prayer, the, the, uh, the object of this prayer, um, or the um, uh, subject of prayer through this portion of scripture. And we're not just looking on praying, we're looking at how to do it effectively. How to pray more effectively. How to persevere in prayer. How to be somebody who prays not just once, but continues to pray until God says that what he's going to do, he's going to do. Now we're looking at prayer from a legal standpoint. Okay, we discussed weeks ago how to come to the courts of mercy, how to come into the courts of God and learn how to pray from a legal standpoint. We need to focus our attention this morning on why we need to pray from a legal standpoint. We need to understand why it's important to pray in many times, in many cases that we're dealing with from a legal standpoint. In doing so, we need to recognize how a court runs. Okay, hopefully a lot of you haven't been in court a lot, so you would say, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about, Pastor. All right. Now, some of you may have never been in court, and you've only seen it on L.A. Law or some other show, and you think, well, that's how court works. And sometimes it does work that way, although the bad guy doesn't always go to prison. As well, we're going to talk about how our adversary operates and why he operates the way he does, especially towards us, the way he did against the widow that we'll see he always does so by doing one thing. The, the adversary always acts as a prosecuting attorney. And that prosecuting attorney is there for one reason, to bring accusations against the defendant. And the defendant, in the cases that we're going to be praying about, is going to be ourselves or maybe somebody that we're interceding for. Somebody that we're praying for. So he brings accu accusations against God's people day and night. Revelation chapter 12 tells us that. We know that our adversary is a roamer. I didn't say he's a homer. He's a roamer. According to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8, he, he, he roams the earth like a lion, a roaring lion. And by the way, there's only two reasons really why a lion will roar. One, it's when it's completely satisfied. And two, when it's afraid. And actually, the roar that we always want to hear from a lion when we go to the zoo or we, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, uh, you know, watching lions in a safari, that loud roar is usually a roaring lion's fear coming out of them. Did you know that the, believe it or not, the enemy's afraid of somebody who knows how to pray effectively? Mm -hmm. Did you know that the, the enemy is afraid of you knowing how to pray effectively? And what does he do by roaming? Why does he roam? Well, it's very easy. First of all, did you know that Satan can't be in all places at the same time? He's not God. He's not omnipresent. There's only one God that can do that, and that's our God. Our God can be in all places at all times. 
But Satan does not have that authority. He does not have that ability. He can only be at one place, one time, at, the same, at, at any given time. Now, he sends out his minions to go out and do one thing. That is this, to gather evidence against us to do one thing, disqualify us. You say, what? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. He's trying to disqualify you from pressing in and ever being the child or the person that God wants you to be. If he can disqualify you by bringing up accusations, whether they be true or not true, whether they be past sins that have already been covered by the blood or not, he's always trying to give evidence against you so that he can disqualify you. If you don't believe me, all you got to do is turn to the book of Job, which you don't do right now because we're not going there. But Job, God says to, to Satan, hey, you've been roaming the earth. What's going on? He says, have you ever considered Job? And he said, yeah, Job loves you and praises you and worships you because you blessed him with everything on the face of the earth. Anybody who had all the things that Job had would definitely praise you and worship you, right? And God says, well, here's what we'll do. To show you that you're wrong, I'm going to let you have some, I'm going I'm to let you mess with Job a little bit. Do you think Job was happy about that? you think Job was happy that God removed the hedge of protection around him to allow Satan himself to touch him, touch his finances, touch his body, he touched his marriage? Basically, he touched every area of Job's life to do one thing, to get him to curse God so that he would be disqualified and he could go back to God. Satan could go back to God and say, I told you. I told you the only reason he's worshiping you is because you've blessed him so greatly. He's trying to gather evidence because he wants to disqualify you from ever walking in God's plans, God's purposes, God's promises, or his destiny for your life. If he can get you to feel disqualified or to think that you're disqualified because of a sin issue or a weakness in your life, he can, he can continue to berate you. He will do so because he's afraid that if you ever walk in your purpose, in your plan, the, or God's plan for your life, or the promise that God's got given to you, or the destiny that God has for you, that ye, he knows that should you ever do that, that a part of his kingdom will be weakened, and you will begin to do things in, in, on behalf of God's kingdom for the glory of God that will cause people to even be snatched from the very flames of, of hell because of what you're doing. He doesn't want that. You think he wants you saved? You, that's why, listen, the Christian church has got it all wrong. We say, come to Jesus, come to the altar, and God in Jesus is going to make everything just really cool and great. And when you give your heart to Jesus, you'll never have another problem. You'll never have another situation. You will just be so happy. You're going to be like just so awesomely happy. And then you give your heart to Jesus and for about 20 seconds you're all excited. And then you walk out of the church and what happens? All hell is released on you. More than what you were going through before you came to Jesus. Why? Because the enemy doesn't go, oh, well, you, you, you've, got, you've got Jeff, so all right, we'll leave Jeff alone. No, he's going to try to disqualify Jeff now. I could spend weeks on proving how the scriptures are a legal document. Not only a legal document, but how it operates as a rule of law. Not the law of Moses, not the law of the Pharisees, but the law of the kingdom of God. Throughout most of scripture, we see courtroom settings. And many times God has called his people. You'll see throughout the scriptures where God will say to his people, he'll say, hey, come, we need to meet. We need to come so that I can share what you're not doing right because I'm going to share what I have against you so that you might repent and turn from me. Those are courtroom settings. And so our adversary is always out there looking to operate from a very legal standpoint. And to miss this is to miss the fact that we don't pray effectively many times against the principalities and powers of, of darkness because we don't know that we're in a legal battle. 
we're praying from emotion more than from our birthright. So I want you to turn to Zechariah for a moment. Zechariah chapter 3 gives us an indication of how the enemy works and how the court system works. And it really is going to give us some wonderful insights to how Jesus works in the life of a believer when the enemy comes in and begins to bring accusations against us. Some of the accusations may sound like this. They're not always something that you did wrong. It might sound like this. Oh, you just don't have enough faith. Oh, you know what? You say you love the Lord, but why did you say this? Always accusing us of our, you know, planting a thought in us. Have you ever had a thought that you knew wasn't yours and then the enemy makes it yours? You begin to think it's yours. You begin to, oh man, he's right, that's a bad thought. Oh, and you're like, wait, where did it come from? You ever have a dream that you woke up and say, where did that come from? And it wasn't from the bad spaghetti last night or the ice cream that you had before you went to bed. It was just a spiritual attack, the enemy trying to get you to walk in fear. But look at Zechariah chapter 3. This is a wonderful vision of a courtroom setting. Verse 1 says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. So imagine that. you got the high priest of Israel standing before God, and who's at his right hand? The prosecuting attorney, the accuser of the brethren. Let's keep reading. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Can, can I just say something? Uh, if you've been in Pentecostal churches for half a second, you have heard people rebuking devils. And how do they usually do it? I rebuke you. Ha! Right? Did you notice the Lord is talking to Satan and he never uses the I statement once? He says, the Lord rebuke you. I, I have found that when I say to the enemy, the Lord rebuke you, there's a difference in when I rebuke him. A big difference. When I do it, he goes, who are you, man? I do. I believe Satan's Puerto Rican sometimes. I think he goes, who do you think you are? Hmm? I do. He, he'll say to me, I've, I've, I rebuke you, get out. And, and he's like, what are you doing? But if I say the Lord rebuke you, I don't even have to yell it. I don't have to scream it. That's right. <laughs> we act like the enemy is either deaf <laughs> or we act as though volume somehow scares him. It doesn't. You can say with confidence at times when you know it's the right moment, you can say, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And he'll flee from you. And you say, oh, that's all I got to do sometimes? Yeah, you don't have to scream at him. He'll, sometimes he'll go, I can't hear you, huh? Louder, louder, louder. And you think you're building something up. Well, let's just keep reading. And the Lord said to him, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem, rebukes you. And he says, is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. And I'm going to stop there because this is a vision of Zechariah in a courtroom setting where Joshua the high priest, the man of God, the, ch the servant of God is standing there in soiled garments. Now, whenever you go to court, who's usually in the court? Well, you have a judge. That's a given. You have a defendant. And in our case, the defendant is usually ourselves or somebody else. You also have a prosecuting attorney, the accuser, right? And then you have witnesses, and then you have legal counsel, hopefully, okay? Now, in the courts of heaven, where Satan is always trying to accuse us, that's what Satan means, by the way, accuser of the brethren. 
He's present. The judge, who's our father, he's present. He's seated in the bench. We have angelic hosts who act as our witnesses. But then we have two people who stand, one on our right, one on our left. Jesus Christ is our advocate. He's our attorney. 1 John 2, 1 says, he's our defense attorney. What a great defense attorney. And he's on an eternal, he's on an eternal retainer. We can retain him at any time. And then we have the Holy Spirit, who's our paraclete. A lot of people get these two terms mixed up, advocate and paraclete, because they're not the same. Okay, a paraclete is not the same as the, as the advocate, although what he is the paraclete. The paraclete comes from parakletos, which is the Holy Spirit, and he's an advocate, an intercessor, but he's a legal assistant. And what he is d called to do, he's called, a paraclete is called to come to someone's aid. So you've got the Holy Spirit and Jesus, who are your legal defense team. That's the legal dream team. <laughs> If the sin don't fit, you must acquit. Okay? So you got a stacked team on your behalf. In the courts of heaven, you've got Jesus, your defense attorney. He brought in his right-hand man, which is the Holy Spirit, who's your paraclete, who's there to give you guidance as well. And they're standing there while you're being accused, maybe rightfully so, but being accused of things by the enemy because the enemy, the prosecuting attorney, wants to do what? Wants to disqualify you from ever walking in your birthright that has been purchased through your defense attorney, Jesus Christ. So in Zechariah, Satan has a very strong case against Joshua, the high priest. What's, what, what, is the, what is the indictment against Joshua? His garments are what? They're filthy. They're soiled. Matter of fact, they were soiled. We don't like to talk this way, but it's in there in the, in the Hebrew. It means to be soiled with excrement. With excrement. You know what that is, right? Right. Okay. I'll just leave it there. It's poop. <laughs> His garments are smeared, are soiled, and the word soiled literally has the connotation there of being uh, enmeshed in. So basically it became a part of the cloth. I'm guessing he probably didn't smell very good either. That's not, you know, mentioned. But you can only assume. Have you ever stepped in somebody, uh, you know, uh, dog stuff? And then you bring it in the house? And if you're married, your wife appreciates that greatly. Right? It stinks. Satan was trying to disqualify Joshua from fulfilling God's plan for his life as the high priest. How? Look at his garments. He's soiled. He is so soiled that it's gotten into the fiber of the fabric. It's gotten into the fibers. He's so soiled he can't be the high priest. And isn't that how the Lord acts with, or Satan acts with us? Oh, you just sinned. How can you be a child of God? How can you be a pastor? How could you ever be a leader? How could you ever teach? How could you ever tell people at your, at your workplace that you're a Christian and you just did this? Ever heard that? Am I the only one? Oh, yeah. I know these people had. Yeah. Right? Come on. You've heard it. Oh, man. I failed the Lord. Man. Now all of a sudden you feel like you're disqualified. And when you feel like you're disqualified, do you feel good about yourself? Do you walk around going, I'm disqualified in Jesus. <laughs> no. You walk around. You don't want to talk to nobody. You don't want to go to church. You don't want to read your word. You don't want to pray. You don't want nothing to do with anything that God has to do. Not because you don't love him, but because you just feel like, well, I'm done. He's done with me. I'm done with him. And this is what the enemy always is trying to do. He's trying to disqualify you from the plans, the purposes, and the destiny that God has for your life. 
Now, some might debate whether this was Joshua's sinfulness that caused this whole defilement, or was it something else? I don't know. I will just say this, that when you look in the scriptures, usually this type of uh, analogy represents sin. It usually represents someone's sin or a nation's sin. And because he's here on behalf of um, all of Israel, it may be that he is a representation of what's going on in Israel at the time. So a response is this. God has mercy on him. Here's, look at what the Lord says he does. This is, this is actually pretty powerful. Verse 4. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. Remove them. This is the angel of the Lord, who's been given direction by the Lord. He says, remove, him, remove, remove those garments. And he said to him, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you in vestments. About a month ago, the Lord interrupted our service. And the thought was that many of us are sin conscious, and we're not conscious of the fact that we've been forgiven of our sins. And the Lord has been putting that strongly in my heart, that one of the reasons that people feel disqualified more than anything that has to do with the accusations against us, it's the fact of when they believe, and they're more thinking about the sin issue than the remedy to their sin issue. For instance, if you've been forgiven of something and the enemy keeps reminding you of that, and it was done weeks, months, or years ago, and you're still being bombarded with the rem remembrance of that, that is not God. And that is not the Holy Spirit. That is not Jesus. That is the enemy reminding you of something you did that's already been covered by the blood of Jesus to try to get you to feel like you crossed a line and now you're disqualified. And let me say this. If we truly believe that we are forgiven of our sins and our iniquities have been taken away from us, maybe we should be more conscious of that than we should be of what we did in order for the blood to wash over us. We spend more time thinking about our failures than we do anything else. Matter of fact, we as humans have a 12 to 1 ratio of negativity. For every one thing that we think of or say positive, we have 12 negative things that we say or we will think. There was a fly in the wall study that was done by the University of Kansas back in the 60s. It has since been replicated over and over to be found to be true. And that is this. A fly in the wall study is when you're in sociology class or you're in um, uh, you know, uh, psychology, uh, the professor gave his whole class uh, this assignment to go out into the public places and to do one thing. Observe the interaction with parents and their children. That's all they had to do and write down their findings. And they didn't have to talk to them. There was no interviewing taking place. All they had to do was be a fly on the wall, listen and watch, see what was going on. So as they, know, as they identified a mom or a mom and dad with their children, they would just kind of cozy up and watch them and then listen to maybe the interactions. What the fly on the wall study found out was for every one positive thing that the parents said to their child, there was 12 negative things that were said to them. That has been replicated over and over by different studies, different universities, different think tanks have done the same study. And of course, it's easier now with the malls and different things. And it's been replicated, and it's still the same. We tend to, to, to think more negatively than we do positively about ourselves and about situations. We tend to speak far more negatively than we do positively. And as Christians, wouldn't it be great if we could be so conscious of who Jesus is and what he's done for us, that that would tip that scale, wouldn't it, of how we view our lives and the lives of other people. But we always have the enemy who's always trying to disqualify us. And so the Lord intervenes and he renders the charges against Joshua and thus probably against uh, Israel, he says these are inadmissible because I have already made a remedy by taking the soiled garments off, removing them, which represented, by the way, iniquity. And how many of you know iniquity is different than sins? We'll teach on that at another time. 
Well, there's actually sins, trespasses, and iniquities, and they're not all the same. Okay, iniquities tend to be those things that are ingrained to us by our DNA, things that our fathers, our grandfathers, our grandmothers struggled with. Family iniquities, things that we struggle with today in our walk with the Lord, in our spiritual walk because of the iniquities of our forefathers. It's called generational curses, some people will call them. Okay, or generational bondages. For instance, when, I'm, when I used to do far more counseling here in the church and other churches, and I was doing counseling for other churches here, I, I found that I would walk people when they, when they were dealing with a certain area that they could not get over, they could not get deliverance from. I would have them do a, 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 a generation map, and you would find out that there was generations within their family tree that struggled with this. It might be hatred, it might be unforgiveness, it might be addiction, it could be uh, all types of things. So what the Lord is saying here is I've removed this, these garments and thus by, redo, by doing that, I've also taken the iniquities away from Joshua. And so what did he do? What did he do after he took the garments off of them? Did he leave them naked? Did he leave them exposed? What did he do? He put pure garments on them, right? And what does Jesus do for us? He takes off the filthy garments that have been stained by the things of this world. And what does he robe us with? Robes of righteousness. And we're now king's kids. You're now a prince. You're now a princess in the kingdom. And by the way, you now have legal authority to come into the courts of heaven and pray. He was clothed with a pure, clean garment, and he had a clean turban put on his head. Why? Because that represents the renewing of the mind. Thinking different. Looking at things different. Thinking differently about how I view my life now. I now view myself from the conscious level that I'm forgiven, that I've been blood-bought and blood-washed, that my sins, my trespasses, and my iniquities have all been removed from me. I no longer have to concentrate on those things being a barrier. I can now keep my eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, and I can know who I am in Christ. And how is our, and by the way, this is how our heavenly legal team works for us. Jesus is our advocate. Matter of fact, turn to 1 John chapter 1. We have to read it because you won't believe it until you see it. You've got to just see it. It's, it's right there. I mean, I'm not even making this stuff up. Uh, I'm not that smart. And, I mean, 1 John just, just tells us. It brings it right, right down to it. L listen to this. It says... In verse, uh, we'll do verse 5. It says, this is the message we have heard from and proclaim to you that God is light and in him no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we have no sin, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Verse 1 of chapter 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins, but for the, only, but for the sins of the whole world. Why do you think John used the word advocate there? Because he wanted to let you know that everything that was done for you and me was done from a legal basis. I want to remind you of this before we come to the communion table. Because this is important. Jesus dying on the cross wasn't about you. It wasn't about me. Jesus dying on the cross was not about you. It wasn't about me. We became the beneficiaries of what he did on the cross. But it wasn't about you. And it wasn't about me. You say, yeah, it was. He came to die for the sins of the world. Right. Right, he did. And to save that which was lost. Absolutely. But that wasn't his main purpose for coming. It wasn't. 
No, it wasn't. It was to satisfy the justice system of God. Man had sinned. They were separated from God. And only a perfect man could pay the full legal price of justice so that in the event that man would fall, come up under that full payment, they would be saved. You say, well, now you're just stretching it. No, I'm not. Let's look at Colossians. Because the word bears out everything I just said. You see, the problem with Christianity in the Western culture is we've made it about us. We've made it about us. Jesus died on the cross. We are beneficiaries of what he did, but we, we could never have been beneficiaries unless he first and foremost satisfied the justice system of God. So you look in Colossians, and you look in chapter 2, and you read in verse 9, For in him Jesus... The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And if you have been filled, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with circumcision made without hands by putting off the old body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgive us, forgiven us of all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its what? Legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. In doing so, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The legal demand had to be satisfied first in order for us to be the beneficiaries of salvation. It had to be. So it's not, it's not, it's not always about you. Matter of fact, turn to somebody and say, it's not about you. It's not. It's not about you. And don't say it's, and then turn to them and say, it's not about me. Never has been. <laughs> you see, in this culture, and by the way, the early church would have never recognized the gospel that we preach in most churches today. It being all about us. They would have never, because it wasn't about them. They knew it. It was about the glory of God. It was about God's justice system being satisfied. So here's what happens. You might feel like you've, had, you've been defiled by sin. You may have done some things that you regret, that you've repented of. I'm guessing you have, because the Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So I'll bet all of us. Anybody not ever sin? Great, so we're all on the same page. But how many of you would honestly, without raising your hand, this is an internal question to answer would say, I still struggle with the memory of that sin. There's a particular thing I did, Pastor, ten years ago, six years ago, eight months ago, that I still struggle with the memory of that. And if that's you this morning, I want you to know that that is probably more, not more about you than it is about the accuser reminding you of your sin. Don't we do that with, with offenders? I work with offenders all day. You know the one, one of the hardest things to do in working where I work? Is when I'm standing or sitting with a participant in our program and all they do is talk about everything that they've ever done wrong and why they, all the crimes they've ever committed. And I'll ask them, I'll say, so when was the last time you committed a crime? Oh, it's been two, three, four years. So why are you still majoring on that? You know what they always tell, not always, but most of the time will tell me? Well, nobody will let me forget. Nobody will let me forget. Every day I walk in here, I'm, it's a reminder of what I've done. Yeah, but we're not talking about what you did. We're talking about where you're at and where you can go. Big difference, isn't it? 
And it's taken a while, but we've actually got people to start thinking now that when they walk into the center, that they're actually now not being judged based on what they did. Now they're being addressed on what they're, where they're at and where they're going. And getting a, a person who's in the criminal justice system to break that cycle of thinking of all that they've done wrong and remembering that and bringing them to here and now and looking for a brighter future. If we can do that, what we do is we break the cycle of criminal behavior, criminal thinking, and now we don't have them in our jail systems. We don't have them in our prisons anymore. But what happens? People keep reminding them. Oh, my, my mom keeps reminding me. We had somebody recently tell me this. This is a beautiful story, actually. He graduated. And when he graduated, he came back and he gave a speech and he talked about what changes he made. And he began to cry, he said, because this is the first year that I gather with my family on Thanksgiving that my mom didn't hide her purse. I said, really? He said, yeah, because she's seen the change in me. And... I said, I, I, I had to ask the question. I said, why would she hide her purse? I've been doing this 20 years. I knew the answer, but I wanted to hear it. He said, because I stole it once. And he said, but now she sees that I'm not who I was when I stole it the first time. Now she keeps it out on the counter. What does she do for him? She's helping him to realize, I don't, I'm not thinking about the stolen purse anymore. I'm seeing who you are now. And some of you, you're still thinking about the stolen purses of your life. And that's why you can't get out of your own way. And that's why you need to know how to deal with the accuser because most of that is the accuser reminding you over and over and over and over of your transgression, of your sin issue. And so I pray that you will learn how to pray against the adversary when he comes and he accuses you by recognizing that you have a legal team that will defend your honor and defend who you are. A couple weeks ago I gave you that whole printout on how to pray in the mercy court. Somebody said to me, they said, Pastor, I was praying for you. And the Lord spoke to me that you have been spending a lot of time in the mercy court on behalf of other people. And I said, most of my prayer time now is taking cases of people before the court and seeing things happen. I've seen legal situations, literal legal situations by praying the way that I taught you a couple weeks ago and understanding the legal system of heaven. I saw legal situations back to back to back within a matter of months. God caused those things to totally be changed because we went to the legal system of the courts of heaven in the mercy court. It's a beautiful way to pray. You know why? Because we're praying from our legal standpoint. I'm not praying in my own way. I'm not praying prayers that I have learned in the sense of, oh, Lord, just bless or help or this. No, I'm praying exact. And here's how I pray. And for those of you who weren't here, here's how I pray for somebody in the mercy courts. I'll use me as an example because I, I have a lot of stuff. But if it were me praying for me, here's how I'd pray. I'd say, Heavenly Father, I come before you as the judge of the universe and all things. I come not in my own self, but I come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whose blood I've been washed and cleansed. And according to the word of Hebrews, it says that I can come in boldly before your throne of grace in a time of need. So I come understanding that the adversary is also in the court, and I also understand that so is Jesus and the Holy Spirit and angelic host. I come before you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who sits at your right hand, but is also defending me or defending Eric Dorman in this case. Eric Dorman is guilty of doing what the enemy has said. However, Eric has also confessed his sin. He's confessed his iniquities. He's confessed it. I know this to be true, and I've seen the change in Eric's life. 
I present to you this person because the accuser is reminding Eric constantly of his past failures and he can't seem to get the victory over those memories. So I am asking you right now to first of all put a restraining order on the enemy from talking to Eric about his past. And I'm asking you to give Eric the, the, the peace to know that he's not only been forgiven but that his sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west. I ask that you be reminded that Eric asked you into his life in 1972 and he asked you to be his Lord and Savior and he has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and Jesus can speak on behalf of Eric and talk about how his blood has covered Eric's life. I'm asking you to remove the sin, not only the, the sin stain that's been removed, but the memory of it. And I'm asking you to tell the adversary that he no longer has authority over Eric in this area of the sin. So I'm asking you for a just judgment, and I'm asking you to do it on behalf of Eric Dorman in the name of your son who stands at my right hand and by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me. So will you do this in Jesus' name? I present this case. The more I've been doing that, I've been doing this for a long time now, every single time that the Lord has said to me, it shall be done, I am giving a verdict on behalf of Eric Dorman. Within a week, within two weeks, I get a phone call from the person and what the Lord said happened. Happened. It's a different way of praying, isn't it? We tend to have our lists. We tend to have our postures. We tend to have all these things. But I'm talking about a more effective way of praying. Do you pray that way every day? No, I don't. But there are times I'm presenting people before the courts of heaven. Because that's what Jesus does. Every day that we come before the Father through His blood, He presents us before His throne faultless. Faultless. Do you know the scripture says that the mercies of the Lord are new every morning? Every morning you get a fresh start with them. Isn't that great? Can we live that way? Can we start living more conscious of who we are in Christ and not what our sins have told us we are? Or what the enemy tells us we are? Wouldn't it be better if we could live with the consciousness of who Jesus is in us than what our sin was back here? Because some of you, you can't get out of your own way because you're too busy disqualifying yourself because you're remembering what you did back here. And Jesus, by the way, if you told Jesus that, Jesus would tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see it. So as we prepare for communion this morning, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what these emblems meant. Yes, Jesus was taking away the sin of the world. He had to pay the debt. Somebody had to. I couldn't do it for myself. You couldn't do it for yourself. We used to sing an old hymn, He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to take my sins away. Well, the only one that could satisfy God's justice and in the highest court of the land in the world, in the universe, was Jesus. And so what did he do? He came and he allowed his body to be broken for you. He came and he allowed his blood to be poured out for you. He came and he allowed himself to become the propitiation or the full payment in satisfying God's justice in our lives. What a beautiful Savior. What a great King that He would lower Himself to my level and become like me with the one exception, without sin. You know Jesus had a sense of humor? Did you know that? I, you know, we've been told that sarcasm is, is hidden anger. I don't know. Jesus, I... You better tell Jesus that because there's a couple times he's sarcastic. He was a sense of humor. Jesus got angry. Je Jesus cried when his close friend died. Have you ever been there? It's a lot more like you than you think, with one exception. He does not dwell on your sin. Because it's been washed, it's been cleansed.